practicing the old ways in modern times. In today's video, I get the exclusive honor to speak with Ivy Mulligan that is going to talk about the meaning behind living heathenry and truly practicing the old ways in modern times. Everybody. Well, hail and welcome back to another episode of Midgard Musings. My name is Jesse, and I am the host here on this channel. If things pertaining to Norse heathenry, Germanic paganism, and quite often what is usually just lumped into this overall category of also true, then I invite you to please subscribe to the channel right down here below. And if you don't want to miss anything, make sure that when you do click the bell notifications that you are selecting all so that way you get notified when I go live, upload new premieres, or any sort of other special and new content that I share here on the channel. So again, today's guest is Ivy Mulligan. It was a really awesome conversation that we had talking about living heathenry. We also went into some discussion about the Guild of Foreign Saith, or Old Ways Heathenry. So much more is going to be talked about during our discussion, and we want to know if after watching this and listening to this. If you are interested in having Ivy come back on the channel for a sort of live Q&A or AMA, ask me anything sort of video. If that's something that you want to see happen here on Midgard Musings with Ivy, then be sure to head down into the comments section and cast your vote or share your thoughts about having Ivy back on here. I, for one, would love to see it happen, but we want to know what you think. All right, so without further ado, here is the conversation that uh, Ivy and I shared. It was awesome. Thank you again, Ivy, for being a guest here on this channel. Uh, for all of you folks that stick around, please don't forget to head down into the description area and check out the links for the guild um, and where you can find Ivy on Facebook. I believe that's the only thing that we've got going on right now as far as social media goes or that she's got going on so, as far as social media goes. All that stuff will be down in the description. Uh, don't forget to check the Midgard Musings Linktree link for all the ways that you can support this channel and my podcasts and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, so without further ado, here we go. I turn it over now to Ivy Mulligan from the Guild of Foreign Save. Thank you goes. Uh, thank you all so much for watching today. All right, everyone. So as I mentioned in the uh, the intro to today's video, I am joined uh, with my very special guest. Uh, Ivy Mulligan. Um, Ivy, why don't you uh, introduce yourself for our viewers and, and for our audience and just kind of uh, expand a little bit on who you are and what you're about with uh, with respects to uh, heathenry in, in today. Okay, thank you, Jesse. I will. Um, as you said, my name is Ivy Mulligan, and I've been doing this path since I was about um, 13. It started uh, in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York. Um, and I was taught under a strega. It was a young woman whose uh, aunt and grandmother had left uh, notebooks written in Italian on how to do witchcraft. And she discovered them hidden in her mom's closet. And one day she came out to me and said, hey, do you wanna learn how to be a witch? And I was like, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> and this was in 1979, 1980. And this was before, you know, internet or bookstores or anything like that. So we went out into the woods and we literally became witches. And because she could speak Italian, because she was, you know, raised in the family, um, she could decipher what the writings were. And we did very many interesting um, old school strega um, work, which has always touched on me and has never left. Um, however, I am a heathen and um, I was raised uh, with uh, Aunt Ingebold and Uncle Canute that used to come over from Norway and then it, then they moved to Austria. But they would come to our house for two weeks every summer and they would um, tell us about like the legends, the mythologies of, of our people. Um, but they would say it in a way that it was more like fairy tales. And so I was always really intrigued by the stories, but the way that they would tell them to me was not 
so much that they believed them is just that they were interesting stories. But even as a little girl, I knew that there was some truth that were in these stories. And I would find myself playing on in the farmlands where I grew up in Indiana, um, applying some of the stories that they would tell me in my everyday life as a child. Um, and of course, that's through pretending and that's through, you know, um, reenacting some of the things. But I learned a lot of wisdom as a young child through these stories of how to deal with uh, like the bully kid on the corner or how to um, talk to the elves or how to actually revere um, nature. And um, I felt, I feel like to this day, if I hadn't been raised in such a way um, fr from my early childhood, I, I don't feel that the living heathenry as I do it today would have been as impactful as it is. Because I find that most people today, when they learn about heathenry, it's very much, um, they find a book um, they're coming off of monotheism. Um, they're trying to ditch the religion that they were raised in and it doesn't do much for them, but they're trying to transpose um, a totally different sort of mindset onto what they were raised with. And I was lucky, my mom is a geochemist and my dad was a businessman and neither one of them were religious in any sense of the word. So I basically was raised as my own natural thing and and i think yeah. i was naturally a heathen at that time and so through the years um after meeting autumn was the strega that taught me um italian witchcraft it started my search for my own roots for my own um way of being my own uh witch and so i through the years um would try to find any book i could get a hold of and back then that wasn't easy um, and then, of course, the internet came out in the early 90s. And when we first got our computer, that was a delight because I could find more access to uh, not only information about heathenry, but also large groups. And at that time, um, the trough was one of the only ones that were recognized and um, networked, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, so um, but back then, they were doing Asatru. Um, and so that meant that they were very stuck in, again, the Icelandic way of doing heathenry. It was, here's these bloats, here's the way you do these procedures, here's how we interpret these mythologies, this is what you need to know, this is how you do it. And in that fact, it was very limiting and stunting because they weren't living it, they were just reciting it. And if you, like everyone else, you know, um, in, in the religious forum could repeat and, and do as told, then you were suddenly an adept heathen. And, and it, that yeah. always left me um, lacking. And, and then the final thing was that I am a very um, connected to the Yontan and to, um, to Loki and to that branch of the divine in heathenry. And back then, um, if I had mentioned that out loud, I, I would have been banned. Well, actually I was, I, I, at one point I came out of the room closet and I said, um, I worship Loki and I was immediately told, no, you don't not with us. <laughs> and so that kind yeah. of, you know, led me to, to finding my own path. And so, uh, I did, and I ended up, uh, really having an epiphany, um, around 2000, I discovered, uh, Ali Gope. He was a, a Sami shaman, but he was actually taught by Michael Harner, who is a American um, core shaman uh, teacher. He, de he developed this whole way of figuring out that all shamans have a core way of doing things, no matter if they're in the Amazon or if they're in um, the Aboriginal people of Australia. Yeah, regardless of the culture. Exactly, exactly. So with that fact, when I found him, uh, he was trying to reignite the Sami traditions in his own um, people, but they were still refusing it because it was still something that was frowned upon. And so he had to literally go to an American core shamanist to develop his own way of living his path to take it back. And and he was he was ostracized by his own people and others for trying to take that step. But um, I, I was lucky enough to finally get to learn under him um, before he passed away through a, a um, correspondence course. And um, it was through his teachings that it really gave me the, the permission and the opening of finding out the core traditions and um, 
the living aspect of, of the heathen that I wish to be. And so with all that blah, blah, <laughs> that's basically how I came to today. That is a fascinating synopsis. That's, a, I mean, if you wanted to like break anything down better, I don't think we could ask for anything more. I think that, you know, giving us a background to um, where you kind of started in your childhood uh, and to, and, and where it led to um, opens up so many questions. So I'm, I'm sure that as people are watching um, this live premiere that they're probably are like, wow, I have so many questions about things. Some of the things that, you know, come to my mind when you talk about the, um, I guess, you know, the involvement that you've had over the decades with various groups, various organizations, various people, and that some of them um, have, you know, uh, like you mentioned earlier with whether it was the troth or whoever, um, that, that your approach, your your desire to want to venerate or include um, some of the divine or some of the sacred um, in your way was looked down upon or frowned upon. And that, I think that's a big thing in heathenry today. Uh, we're talking about living heathenry is that, you know, so many folks come into this and they feel like, you know, if you're telling me how to do how to heathen, um, you know, nobody has a business. Nobody has business telling me how to heathen, right? I'm going to be heathen my way. You're going to heathen your way. What do you think is, uh, I mean, in your experience and over the years, you know, a response to that? Because I feel myself that there is definitely a place for being told or being guided, right? You obviously have, have learned a lot from being taught a lot. And you yourself offer, you know, teaching uh, services. You offer it through the, uh, the Foreign Save Guild, which we're going to talk about here a little bit later on, too. Um, What's your response to that when somebody comes into a, a, a folkway or, or a path such as heathenry, which is, you know, regionally and culturally rooted in so many traditions, um, but yet they feel like there's, you know, nobody can tell me how to heathen. How do you respond to that in, in a way that it's like, yeah, you have to form your own way, but there's also you have to learn how to do it. Like, how do you respond to that? Um, that's a, a really great question. Um, I respond to it personally by stating that there are traditions and there are customs and there are heritages that uh, make heathenry unmistakably recognizable. And so to be on this path, you have to have the basis of that understanding to call yourself that thing. So like, as far as I'm concerned, everyone that wants to practice heathenry has to really make an effort to read the Eddas, to read the sagas, to read the manuscripts that were still left to us to this day so that we can get a mindset and a feel for what our ancestors did and how they thought and um, how they viewed the world. And we're doing that not because we're trying to imitate them, not because we're trying to live in the in the Bronze or Iron Age um, whenever you know you or however far back you go, um, but we're doing it because we want to respect and honor the wisdom that has survived all those thousands of years to our hands to this day and our awareness. We're, we are bringing forward into a modern time the ancestral wisdom that our people, our you know uh, ancestors, I guess, for but, but not mm. just that whole culture. You know, we're bringing that wisdom, the indigenousness of those people, we are bringing that wisdom into today. And so in that fact, you have to have a base knowledge. You can't, you can't just start pulling from uh, like Hinduism or, um, or Sufi or voodoo or even standard witchcraft and then, and then just say, well, this is heathenry. If it doesn't have the basis of the tradition or, or the lore or the understanding of how these people uh, viewed things. But again, like I say, we're not trying to be in um, the Bronze Age or the Iron Age or the Viking Age because those days are gone and it's not applicable to today. Um, so there is this fine line where to honor the old ways, you have to stop trying to mimic them, but you can also bring them forward and transform them into a usefulness for today. And so it, it still smacks of those things that you recognize but, but it's also fully modern and it's fully mm. doable for today, if that makes sense. Right. And I'm glad that you touched upon it as well, um, because in all of my videos um, and as, as part of kind of like uh, an intro, everyone sees this 
phrase, um, and I've mentioned it before, that we are practicing old ways in modern times. And what are those old ways? You know, uh, foreign safe, you know, the, those ancient traditions, the things that predate the, uh, I, I, I'm not myself one, but I know a lot of folks who, who are reconstructionist types, even reconstructionist type heathens, where they, um, they, they, they observe holy tides based off of historical heathen calendars that predate the Christianization period of Scandinavia and, and, and these countries. Um, and I feel like there's, you know, a lot of questions like, wow, practicing old ways in modern times and, and that there's some things that people think, well, we can't really do that anymore because, you know, you look at some of the traditions that were, or some of the things that were documented in, whether it be eyewitness or hearsay type, we're talking about sources like um, Adam of Bremen or Tacitus, who weren't necessarily there, but that may have been around or heard from others. And it was, you know, chatter that was going around and they documented, well, this is how things were done. And, and you know, we're not going to be able to, you know, recreate or relive the the nine year sacrifice at Uppsala, you know what I mean? In, in modern times, literally but the essence i think the the uh the power of those traditions and i think that i don't know what you think but i think that tradition is is, is such a thing that we have a, a responsibility as heathens in modern times to build our own right we build our own tradition so that way the people who come after us whether it be our uh family our descendants or those who we tie weird with our extended family our kith uh can carry on these, these legacies as well what do you what do you think about that type of approach and how it fits into, you know, modern time and that whole thing. Yes, I agree with you 100%. And in my um, first book that I wrote, which is a workbook for my year-long students, um, I actually put a, a little section in there about creating your own traditions for today. And um, I think that it's very important that uh, a tradition is understood as something that is done to honor a period of time or a or a, a spacious moment of time, or um, perhaps even a person's life or death, you know, at, at this period of time. And so a tradition is something that has to change, but yet the core of it stays recognizable. And I, I'll give an example. Um, so we're gonna go with Uppsala and we're going to go with the, with the um, sacrifice because um, it just so happens that we're going to be doing a, um, gathering in July for a whole group of people um, at, at my home and we're going to do workshops and I have people like Lars um, Eckerton and um, uh, Inger, Lindy Fahela, she's going to come too. So these are uh, Norwegian and Swedish Sc Scandinavian friends of mine that are going to come and they're very traditional. Um, Lars is a Glima um, master oh, wow. as well, uh, runology. So um, they're really incredible people. And of course they have traditions in, in, in Scandinavia because they still live there and um, they can still have immediate access to it. So we're going to reenact at our homestead, um, a, a bloat, a sacrifice um, for our gathering and for our food, but it's only one day and it's going to be a, an animal that we procure that we've cared for and that we've tended to. And everyone has to witness, you know, if if they can. I, I don't say have to, but we encourage everybody to witness, you know, its slaughter. And then we explain its life force and we bloat, you know, to the gods for and our ancestors and the spirits of place so that we can further our connection together as kith and kin. And so we're taking an old tradition. And so in Uppsala, when they did the the all the human sacrifices, it was for that very reason, but but it was in a different time where that was a thing of honor, that was a thing of expectedness, that was a thing of um, you know commonplace act. Well, right. you wouldn't do that today, obviously, you know. <laughs> but but we replace it with animals because we eat those animals. We're not doing it to kill the animal. We're doing it to further our life force by honoring the life of that animal that it gave to us. And, um, and we're doing it in the traditional old school way with, you know, with the, all of us dressed in period clothing, you know, and all of us saying, you know, the chants and the um, songs that we need to, that our ancestors did, but 
rewritten for today and and spoken in English. You know, mm -hmm. we're not, we don't, I mean, Lars, of course, he, he'll, he'll galder in, in Swedish, but, um, and I'm sure Lindy Fay will sing in, in um, Norwegian, but I myself will, will speak English and the people around me will understand what I'm saying. So basically you want to remember to pass down to your descendants um, these traditions because it's not the thing itself that you're doing that matters as much as it's the thought and the reasoning behind it. That is what makes the tradition and a custom something that's very um, sacred and something that can continue on and be recognizable throughout time because it's always followed and it's always remembered and it's always practiced, but changed so that it's applicable and people want to continue to do it. I, I, I really like that. You know, um, I've, I've, I've said something and I've shared this theme or this idea that um, tradition uh, is not the worship of ashes it is rather the preservation of fire and i like to use that analogy and i was wondering what your thoughts were on it is because in similar fashion are right, you talking about you know um doing things in a very traditional way but but uh adjusting it to appeal to the the, the modern day right because old languages let's say for instance or if i wanted to say things in, in old norse or in a language that's not, i'm not accustomed to or, or the people who i tie weird with and share frith with and build and share frith with don't speak that what real value what you know the purpose of that like it sounds cool it may look neat or whatever but ultimately like you like you like you had mentioned you know you're, you're trying to do things that um our descendants can work from and and, and continue to build on uh so you know to, to say these to galder these things in a, in a foreign language that doesn't really mean anything to us like it might look cool or it might sound cool but um i think the intent behind it like you mentioned before the reason is, is a big part of it you know why are you are we doing the thing why are we practicing it in this way why are we you know choosing to you know uh, hold it in this sort of fashion it's, it's it's not that we're trying to worship something dead and gone it's we're trying to the, the, the fire, the living aspect of it, we're honoring that or, or, or preserving that sort of thing, right? Exactly, exactly. And and when you said that, you know, I, I go to the, um, in the end of the story of Ragnarok, um, when, you know, everybody steps out, whoever survived, they step out of the tree and they're walking through the grass and they find the chess pieces and they pick it up, you know, and they're like, oh, and, um, and, and they, you get the sense that they're gonna continue the chess game, right? The, the game didn't stop because right. the original players are removed from the game board. The, the game continues with their descendants. And now their descendants are gonna play the way that they know how, and they will, they will honor what, what the original players did because they knew their moves and their, and their ways of, of thinking strategies but they're going to implement their own ways of doing it because that's what's that's what matters. It's 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 how you do it. It's how you can relate to it. It's how you can do it proficiently and with um with uh what's the word I want um uh oh I'm, the word is eluding me. But you know uh, anyone who does this path shouldn't have to always fall on how well can I recite the Eddas? What mm -hmm. manuscript did I find this information in? Can I say this date and this time and, and rattle it off? Can I pronounce this name correctly? None of that matters. What matters is the base form of, of, the, of the understanding that you get from these manuscripts or from the stories that they're telling. Because you need to have um, some sort of bravado and, and self-assuredness that when you step into your sacred space, because we're pagans, when it when it when we boil it down we're pagans and when you step into your sacred space wherever that is or whatever it is you want to know that you are proficient and in, in interacting with those that you choose to serve and you want to know they hear you and you want to know that you can um eloquently get across your desires in your um in your life and um the weird that you're trying to weave um so i really feel that uh, Things get lost in in the world of, oh, I have to be, you know, 100% accurate or I'm not doing it right. I can't stand it when 
reconnaissance or reconnaissance um, reconstructionists say, you know, it's got to be this way, and they did it after this full moon, and and oh, you know, and it's like, well, you know, we don't do it like that now because now we have uh, time change, and now we have, um, yeah. you know, all these other elements that come into play, and and you know, if our ancestors were standing in front of us right now, living alongside of us, they would adapt as we would because they didn't call themselves a Norse pagan back then. They were just living heathens that did what they did because that's what kept them connected to the to their space and time in life. In my opinion. Yeah. yeah. I uh, I like the approach and I and I think it's more it's it's holistic. You know what I mean? It doesn't bottleneck us into well, it's got to be this way all the time and I, you know, I encourage people to find their own way. Um, and figure it out how they want a heathen. You know, do you want to follow a reconstructionist path? Do you want to be a bit more, you know, I say, you know, fluffy bunny or eclectic? It's however it works for you. Um, wisdom is wisdom regardless of where we find it. And that may be a loose translation of something that is even found in one of the sagas. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head which one it is. And it's, uh, the wisdom is wisdom regardless of where we find it or regardless of where it comes. So if it fits and if we can apply it, um, for the betterment of ourselves and our loved ones and our the kith and kin that with whom we, you know, interact, uh, then then why not, you know, why not incorporate that? And you seem to have really um, uh, taken hold in that arena, I think, with the the Foreign Save Guild, or if I'm saying that correctly. So, uh, could you maybe, uh, for, for those that are going to be watching and listening, um, talk about what the what we're talking about here, the the, the foreign state guild. What's the the mission behind it? What's the you know purpose behind it uh, in the aspect of living heathenry today? Okay, um, yeah, I developed the guild to, about three years ago. I got the idea to create this guild because I was part of TAC for a long time, the Astura community, and it's a it's a wonderful organization. Um, it it really reaches a lot of people, um, but it's a very uh, first step kind of organization it's where most people go when they're first learning about being heathen and um so i found through the years and it's such a large organization too that you know it's hard to um finitely train people or give them the information that they need or the or direct them into where they need to go to find you know whatever their interest is in heathenry um so i decided after a couple years of being um involved with tac I decided that, you know, we really need a, a specific uh, place where people could go and get um, specified uh, traditions taught to them by masters or people training under those masters. And um, I had been involved with a guild years ago, um, which I think many heathens had been, um, and but it was only for runes. And so it's one of those things where it was very limited. And I'm like, well, if if we're going to do a guild that teaches specific uh, things in heathenry in a in a very finite way, why not have a guild that's like living heathenry? And that's where I came up with the idea. And so I um, classify my definition of living heathenry as the act of using heathen ethics, mythos, traditions, and customs in um, in our day to the world to women in old ways in the world today. Sorry, I'm trying to read my own writing and I'm like, eh. So, um, so basically I thought, well, you know, there's people I know that have gotten uh, reached through heathenry through blacksmithing. Um, I've known quite a few people that were atheists, all right? And, and then they picked up a hammer and they started um, blacksmithing. And before you know it, they were channeling their ancestors and suddenly they understood so much about the heathen path and they had never picked up an Edda or a, a saga. Um, I know women who weave and spin and the same thing. They were, they were pagan, sort of speak. They were like eclectic witches. Um, but once they started that drop spindle and they started really weaving, they started having this uh, understanding and connectivity to their ancestors because they were European. And then they started understanding weird and that really opened the door for uh, Scyther or Scyther, Scyther work for them. Um, and then I know people who are farmers and homesteaders and when working with the land and getting their hands dirty and planting those seeds and, and raising those animals and slaughtering them at the time, 
Um, they were already heathen, but they're heathen redeepened into a real and uh, obtainable path because every day they were living this path. They weren't just reading about it. They weren't just uh, studying it now and again. They weren't just getting to it when it was convenient for them and life stopped. They learned that when you integrate your spiritual path into your everyday life, like our ancestors did, suddenly it becomes very real and it becomes very meaningful. And it gets you through times that are very rough or times that you just don't know where you're gonna find the strength, but you do. Um, and it also makes joy in places that you may not have seen that joy before. And it gives you pride in yourself and it gives you pride in, in your family and um, pride in your community and being the best person you can be because now suddenly you have something to be very proud of. So um, this guild is basically just, I collected a group of uh, teachers, which we call them master craftsmen or craftsmen. And um, then their students, their apprentices, uh, learn through teaching in and of itself to reach others, to, to create more apprentices and whatnot. It's, it's like any guild, you know, it works the same way. But instead of it being a writing skill or just a specified like runic skill or metalworking skill, it's all of the skills of, of foreign side, which means old customs. And so um, it, it's basically that in a nutshell. Yeah, and, I, and I've, you know, gone over your uh, or I've gone over the website, um, the Guild of uh, Foreign Side, HeathenFire.com. So for everybody that's going to be watching all the details about the guild are going to be uh, down in the description of the video um and it's i mean it's it's the real deal you know this isn't for the fly by night let me think about it sort of kind of person i mean just to be real i get a sense that this is for like you mentioned the person that's just really wanting to get into it for uh they, they, they want to understand it uh, and and build their heathenry um, in a very dedicated sort of way um i also think that not everyone is positioned to adopt heathenry to this extent and i don't feel like they should that, that people should feel um like they are a lesser heathen for it because we've seen throughout time that certain individuals within a society hold or carry a certain position and that position is not you know you know you may have the voiva or you may have the the say kona you may have a rune master you may have a um, a medicine man or the shaman, you may have the, the chieftain, you may have like various cultures have different names for these positions, but just because you're not one thing or the other doesn't make you less of a person. You have a place in society, but if your place in society is for you thinking that you, you're gravitating more towards this type of stuff, more of the, the mysticism, the spirituality things to, to understand how our ancestors may have embraced the, the sacred or the divine, uh, this definitely fits the bill i think it, it it looks like a lot of what people would be looking for um but how do you how do you think what i'm saying there uh, ivy in terms of you know the position in, of, of individuals in here because a lot of what i've seen at least in my short time as being a heathen is you know the person coming into heathenry perhaps someone like myself who came in from a, a totally different worldview of things i was raised and uh, brought up in a very christian worldview of things so adjusting my world, relearning, re being reprogrammed, as it were, to think differently, look differently uh, at, the, at the world. A lot of what can come when you are coming into a new worldview is, oh, I've got to do it this way. I've got to do it that way. You're, you're carrying a lot of baggage, thinking that, well, because I'm a heathen now, I have to bloat. I have to read the runes. I have to know what the runes mean. I have to do this. I have to, you know, I have to do save work. I have to, I have to do this because I'm a, a heathen now. And I personally don't think that that's a, a, a mindset that people need to adopt. I think there's other things that they should consider first. And my opinion is that they should consider their relationship with their ancestors and with the localized spirits with whom we share existence, because these are the entities. These are the, the forces, if, if, if we want to call it that, that have more to do with our day-to-day -day interactions, our, our and I have a more vested interest of us and what we do day to day than, let's say, the divine, the sacred, the gods. Um, what, you, what would you say to that? How would you respond to that? Yes, I, I think that's very uh, beautifully said and, and a really great uh, 
subject to bring up because dogma is what most Christians are trying to come away from or, or any organized religion, okay? Um, I feel personally that the difference between a pagan path and a um, like a Christian or Muslim or Hindu or any any religion is is simply that pagans tend to be spiritual, whereas um, other groups tend to be religious. And and when you say the word religion, now you you're coming into procedures, dogma. Um, like you said, it has to be done this way. If I'm going to be a heathen, I got to bloat. I got to, you know, runes, you know, blah, blah. And, and, and it's because for, you figure for almost 1500 years, the world has been groomed to think like a monotheistic person, no matter what path they chose, you know, paganism was pretty much wiped out by the, by the world dominating religions. And so the, to control you have to have rules and to keep a whole mass of people thinking the same way you have to have dogma and you have to have you know um certain set ways of doing things so to me a, a pagan is a maverick and a, and a heathen pagan is is totally a self-sovereign thinker and that means that we care about our community but like you say our community starts with the ground that we stand on. Um, because back in the day, you know, before pagans knew that that's what they were called, you know, primitive normal man um, had to depend on the environment to survive. And how that happened, and I call this indigenousness, because yes, even at one point, Europeans, yes, we were indigenous people as well. And so to learn to be one with our environment, like all indigenous people, is that we have to develop a relationship with it. And we have to listen as much as we um, talk. We have to give as much as we take. We have to have awareness as much as we are um, being the the one that's um, experiencing it. So I really feel that with heathenry, um, when you come into it, don't fall into that trap of like, you have to do it a certain way because spiritual belief systems and spiritual paths are extremely personal and you know no two people do it the same and they shouldn't and you know, back in the day we weren't expected to i mean you could go to, to one household in a, in a village and they would they might do a certain procedure you know like maybe honor their land that year or the alts or whatever at a certain time in a certain way and two houses down they might do it totally different and and, yeah. there, and no one criticized the other that was their personal thing you know and as long yep. as you were living happily in the in the community was happy then everybody was well and um there is a caveat though to that that i will say that through time mankind has developed through sharing information um that the collective conscious of somebody of a group of people when they decide to get together and they both and they all share a common goal and do it a certain way they can they can do great work they can do great feats um, so like say with a, a, a bad weather uh, experience, say that there's a drought and everybody is losing their crops and, and they're gonna face starvation. If they all band together as a town and they all get like say the side Kona of the town to, to be the, the ruling force of this particular ritual that they would do for calling for rain um, because they all came together and did it as a like mind, now they, they had a force that was to be reckoned with because instead of one person's voice yelling to the cosmos, it was a hundred people's voices. And so that those voices were heard probably a little bit better than the one, but it doesn't mean they were doing it right or wrong. It just meant that they found together a unified way of, of um, accomplishing a goal successfully. And that isn't to be mistaken for dogma. That's yep. just something that works because, you know, as a group, they figured it out. Right. I like to use the analogy, and I've heard this a number of times before, where, you know, you throw a, a pebble in a pond and the ripple effect that it has is much smaller than if you were to throw a thousand rocks or a giant boulder. You know, the louder the voice, the more resonance that it carries. You know what I mean? Um, and when you're talking about connecting to the sacred and with the sacred, that's how we see, at least through historical sources, that's how we see the, the sacred interacting. They are 
uh, it's a tribal based uh, approach. You know, we have the Aesir, the Vanir. Uh, it's a tribe, societal. It's tribally based. You know, so we see that. Okay, well, to interact with them, we we we, we find at least similarities. And and I think our ancestors tried to model themselves in that sort of way, or, or look to their to those examples as a way of well, you know, let, let's you know try to. Uh, build our society or build our community around uh, the, the, these sacred forces, or how, however it may have developed over time. Um, but I agree with you that uh, you know the 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 you know to give you have to get. It's reciprocation. The gifting cycle is probably one of the biggest constants that we see across. I think a lot of different pagan cultures or pagan practices, even, um, but especially in in I mean, that's been one of the biggest constants that I've seen is that, you know, um, you, you give what you get, you get what you give, and, and that cycle continues. It's, it's reciprocation is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, Jesse, you brought up something interesting, too, that I wanted to address um, before the end of this um, podcast or broadcast, and that is um, you asked me before about, you mentioned something before about um, kind of the chain of command, I guess, is how I interpreted it. And what I mean is many heathens, when they first come to this off of monotheism, um, they immediately go to the gods, right? Like they're, they're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to start venerating the gods and yes. I'm going to interacting with the gods and, you know, which is fine. Um, but I, I, I have to say from, from what I've experienced and what I've learned, um, through the years of pagans in and of themselves, the gods were, uh, the, the last chain of command. And what I mean by that is that the veneration always started with the land you stood on, the land that here. Um, and then the ancestors of that place, right? Like not only your own ancestors, but whoever's blood and bones and, and flesh has turned into the soil that you're standing on. Those are the things that you're asking for wisdom and help from because they're right there. And then, yep. of course, your ancestors, because they are in you, they're in your blood, they're they're in your DNA, and someday you will be somebody's ancestor, right? So that power of connectivity through the family lines, well, that's another way. And then um, I've come to the idea um, just by uh, reading uh, Snorri's uh, Eddas that I personally believe that ancestor worship is not understood by very many new heathens today and um i have been exposed to voodoo i've been exposed to shinto i've been exposed to many other faiths that do ancestor veneration and um when they do it they believe that through great deeds and great works uh, a human being can can raise themselves to godhood right and so i personally feel that the vanir the asir all those people that we revere as gods were at one time real people. Um, they were really uh, a hero, just like the Celts. The Celtic people also believe the same thing. And so right. um, through venerating them by their works and deeds and keeping their names alive and singing their stories and, and telling them over and over, they don't have to reincarnate anymore. They don't have to come back through the family line and fix their weird because they've reached the ultimate Orlog. And so mm -hmm. now they are now they are you know our ancestors of the greatest importance helping us but but they are only to be needed when there's no other recourse if that makes sense because there's so many of us and only a few of them you know what i mean and like mm. i don't know I, I mean i don't know anything about the afterlife other than what i've seen you know in my visions and things like that but um i'm just by what i've seen i'm thinking there's lots of us and few of them and the gods are very busy. So if you need something, find it for yourself and, and try to get it, you know, through the tools that you have readily available, which is your land and your ancestors and your real kith and kin. Just, you know, as a side note. Yeah. No, I think that's a absolutely uh, wonderful thing to bring up. And it opens the door for so much more follow-up questions, which I'm hoping that our viewers that have that are going to be watching this live premiere are noting down or asking even in the live chat as it pops up. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, if you're ever interested to come back and we'll, we'll gauge that response by, you know, our uh, the subscribers and viewers that are 
tuning in for this. Um, if you would like to come back and maybe be a part of a live Q&A or a live AMA, um, some, so much of what you're talking about right now, I think, um, fuels questions. You know, um, a lot of what I hear you talking about now as we close reminds me of um, the stories of the gods as depicted by uh, Saxo Grammaticus, you know, in, in the, the, the Danes, uh, uh, forgetting the, the actual Latinized uh, tales that he that he documented down. But it reminds me a lot of that, where the gods were people, the gods were part of um, a, a culture, society, you know. Um, I did a, re a video recently about Balder, um, where in Saxo's um, retake of it, it's, you know, Sac uh, Balder was uh, a bit different portrayed differently than uh the like icelandic sagas um mm -hmm. more more details were shared about that figure because it was a different sort of it was, it was more human there was more human element to it you know you can relate more and i, I feel like the pagans today uh we, we try to find some similarities with the gods because of their, their their fallacies of their seemingly like you know they're not omnipotent they're not all knowing they're not you know even odin who was the chiefest of the gods in, in a lot of the views of things is is largely flawed and diabolical in so many ways and there's a lot of opportunity here to, to discuss in greater depth uh more than what we have time for today but i i love the uh the analysis that you shared with us here um today and um you know so we'll 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 turn to the viewers you know for everybody that's watching live now um if you want to hear more uh and you want to see more let us know you know, share it down in the comments and um, maybe we can get Ivy back on here and uh, talk about some more stuff over time. So um, everything else that we've talked about, the the, the link for the guild, the, the Foreign State of the Guild, um, if you guys are interested and want to learn more about that, please go to the description. Um, the links will be down there. You can research yourself. Um, also on Facebook, uh, Ivy, if it's all right with you, you guys have, or you at least that I know of, have the 21st century heathen age uh, reclaiming practice of Seder and Volva, uh, which you share a lot of interesting uh, and informative articles and things over there as well. So for those of you that are on the Facebook platform, you guys can follow really interesting stuff uh, there as well. So if you're interested in wanting to get deeper into things, um, head down to the, the description of the video and check out the guild website more details on that um so before we wrap this up uh ivy was there anything else that you would like to say or, or share uh, for everybody that's watching right now yes um i just want to say that no matter what you're doing or no matter what stage of heathenry that you're in always just take away the idea that you are very competent and very capable to worship um the old ways in new days um, how you see fit because if it resonates with you and it makes your life meaningful and rewarded then you're doing it 100% correct and that's all I have for you <laughs> good advice um, I, I, I've had a lot of people on here that that share a very similar sentiment you know uh, feels right you know if it feels good if you've gotten a good response um, trust your gut and something that I've heard a lot um, as well. And, I, and uh, myself as a relatively new pagan, I mean, six years out of the grand scheme of things is still pretty new um, in comparison to a lot. But uh, I've, I've I found my path and I've, I've kind of walked my own path with the help of a lot of people, but I've made it my own. Um, so I would echo with you, Ivy, and for a lot of others. So yes, um, you can't, you don't find a way then make a way right <laughs> um make your own path <laughs> mm -hmm. i agree 100 yes and awesome. thank you Jesse. this has been wonderful and your um your presentation and your podcast or uh youtube videos are wonderful and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and keep up the good work because you're letting people's voices be heard that uh, maybe wouldn't be by any other way. So I, I highly um, am grateful and highly appreciative of all the hard work that you do. And I appreciate your time and being willing to come on here and share with everybody what you know and 
uh, point people in a, in a direction that can help them as well. So we're all here to, to help. And that's that's the main goal for what I do and for a lot of others that I respect. And so um, for everybody that's watching, uh, thank you for watching this episode today. And be sure to interact um, on the social media platforms that not only I share, but that Ivy shares as well. If you want more uh, from Ivy or from us, you know, let us know. Um, share all that information uh, with us. You can contact us through our social media platforms or comment down below. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Hail, we'll see you in the next video. Hail.